Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our session with our guest speaker, Professor Michelle Oko from Duke University. I'm Oben Zawu, and uh, I'm delighted to say a few words about our program funded by the European Commission through the 2020 and Mercury Actions. And we we're happy, actually, we're happy to, to announce on April the 28th, our six um, annual uh, North American Environment, uh, Energy and Natural Resources Conference uh, um, at uh, the UH uh, with uh, Blank Rome as um, a partner. And also next month, our program will, uh, uh, will host a webinar with uh, Professor Smita Narula from Pace University. So please visit our website, www law.uh.edu slash inner center, where you will find the uh, upcoming events in the series and um, the host of our uh, past recordings. Uh, feel free to use the chat box for your questions. And in due course, we will be displaying the CLE credit slides. Then I turn it over to Professor Tracy Hester, co-director of the inner center and our chair this morning. Thank you, Alban, and good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to be here as always. I uh, want to make sure that uh, I wasn't quite I, in a situation where I can't hear quite clearly. So uh, if Vaughn said that I was the director, I want to point out that I'm the co-director and that one of my fellow co-directors is on the screen with me, uh, Professor Victor Flatt. And it is both our pleasures to welcome everybody here today for our ongoing speaker series uh, for the Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Center at the University of Houston Law Center. Uh, just a few brief notes, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, the Inner Center, University of Houston, is a legal research center dedicated to exploring issues that arise at the intersection of environmental and energy law and policy and uh, legal demands. So as a result, we're finding ourselves exploring the forefront of issues of things such as the carbon transition and energy system, energy equity and justice, uh, environmental social governance issues, it's a rich and formal area, and our center is uh, delighted to be exploring it in the uh, energy capital of the United States and the world, in Houston, Texas. So in that regard, I did want to mention uh, one brief note that the North American Energy Conference is one of the events we do every year. Uh, Professor Flatt has been the leader in helping in that program underway and growing every year. Uh, our profession this year has, uh, interestingly, we have both the executive director for the uh, U.S. Energy Association, as well as the uh, director for the International Energy Association back to back. We should hopefully have an interesting comparison for those of you who can join us on April 28th. So with that, let me turn to our topic today, which is a fascinating one and our speaker. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Michelle Oko, who is at Duke University, but is actually going to be joining the faculty at Lewis and Clark this fall as an assistant professor. Uh, she is writing on the topic of forgotten water, which is actually one that has generated a great deal of interest, particularly for those of us who look at environmental justice and urban colonial. Uh, her paper is going to be uh, published uh, in Georgetown Law Journal and is obviously a topic of great interest. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll also say two quick things. If you have questions, as Abba mentioned, please feel free to post them in chat. We'll try and curate them. And uh, if you do want to raise your question uh, directly, uh, Professor Oko has asked that we try and uh, have those questions at the end of her presentation uh, so that she has a chance to uh, get through the comment materials in a sufficient way. So with that, uh, I turn the microphone over to our speaker. Yes. Thank you. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here with you all today um, and to be able to discuss this particular topic. As mentioned, I am currently um, a senior lecturing fellow with, with Duke um, Law School. Specifically, I'm part of the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. And um, I will be joining the Lewis and Clark faculty as an assistant professor there. Um, recently, you know, I'm also very active in the American Public Health Association. So in addition to um, 
to my actual official work, I've also engaged in some, got a lot of different projects through um, my membership there. And I am, I recently received a Rebecca A. Head Award from the Environment Section of um, the American Public Health Association. And um, actually in that same vein, I, I also uh, wanna add that I have recently completed my master's of public health. So um, I will be officially having my graduation in May, but um, I am done with everything that I need to do in that capacity. So um, I am very excited to be able to be here with you today and discuss this topic that is very, um, significant to the work I've done um, in all of those capacities. So this particular paper that I will be discussing will be is entitled Forgotten Waters. And there are certain themes that evolve throughout my paper. So specifically, um, you know, the areas that I focus on in this paper that really kind of guide my conversation is social forgetting and especially um, with social forgetting that's you know kind of partially where the title of my paper comes from but essentially referring to how in groups um, including societies how negative in areas of our history we have a tendency to forget are essentially put towards the back of our mind as opposed to um, thinking about on the forefront. Um, so that's, you know, social forgetting. For forgetting is a significant aspect um, of this paper. And specifically with the communities that I'm discussing, uh, to a large extent, they seem to have been forgotten. Um, I also discuss themes of power. And um, this is very important when we talk about um, disadvantaged communities, but really going into looking into the different areas of power. So whenever we think of power, a lot of times we will think about um, specifically power over, right? That's a circumstance where you have, may have one group, right? Be dominating another. Um, and it's kind of more a competitive concept of power um, where, you know, it's pretty much there's a winner and there's a loser. But when it comes to power, actually, feminist theory has brought a lot to bear as far as how we conceive of power. And specifically, in addition to aspects of power over, there's also power to, the actual power to achieve something and power with. That's our power of coalitions, of relationships, the power to be able to work together. Um, and then also that concept of power steps beyond this competitive nature of power, where instead of just thinking for me to have something, someone else must not have something, it's the idea that there's space for us to be able to be able to share. Um, now, the other area is in relation to legal epidemiology. So that, in a sense, focuses a lot on standards. Um, you know, that really kind of evolved from work that's been done by um, Sokobi Wilson and Omega Wilson in regards to realizing that we, we have laws with health-based standards and not noticing that there are lots of groups in America and just in general in society that these standards are not meeting and that should be a concern as far as the action that we need to take. Um, another framework is essentially looking at determinants of health and specifically the structural determinants of health in relation to those aspects of governance, those aspects of power, those aspects of um, existing discrimination, within our society and specifically, right, the structural determinants are those, those building blocks that were there actually from the creation of our country that deals with class, right? That deals with um, racial discrimination and how that really kind of evolves to ultimately impact 
our health. Now, you will see um, right here, this is a picture and this, um, this particular in image comes from the Western Revitalization Association um, website. And this particular image I found to be very, very striking. So right here, you see two homes. They're across the street from each other. So the home on the left is from a community called White Level. Um, both of these communities are outside of Mebane, North Carolina. They are unincorporated areas um, of, 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 Me of Mebane. And that the, there's the house on the left and the house on the right. The house on the right comes from um, a majority white a wealthier community. Um, you'll notice pick a fence there and really kind of one of some of the differences that exist. The reason why it's important to see how there's this juxtaposition is because the community on the left does not have access to many basic amenities. So um, that includes, um, when I talk about basic amenities, I'm referring to things such as drinking water, sewage, sidewalks. Um, and you'll see kind of that dramatic contrast. So it's not a circumstance where these two communities are far from each other. They're right across the street from each other. And the Mill Creek community, the one with the picket fence, is a newer community, while the community on the left is an older community. So what I'll focus on specifically today is remember I was talking about those communities that with uh, um, without the access to those basic amenities. Um, specifically today, I will be focusing on drinking water. And one of the things I mentioned is you know the aspect of being unincorporated and municipal services, right, provides a lot of different services, and I mentioned drinking water, sewage, sidewalks, but also um, aspects such as fire protection. Um, and these can be missing, right, if a community is not incorporated. And specifically what we're looking at right here is those communities without access to safe drinking water, without municipal water available to them. So um, this, has as, this has significant aspects on where a community will get their water. So essentially in that circumstance, um, you're not in a system where you're connected toward municipal services, specifically um, being able to have access to drinking water from those services, then you have to rely on private drinking water wells. And for private drinking water wells, right, one of the things that's significant is that those wells do not fall under the regulation of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So Safe Drinking Water Act, right, is, is fairly, is very significant. Um, because it, it really regulates public water systems within the United States and creates standards by which um, the water we have access to um, must meet. And really, water treatment and disinfection overall is considered one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. But the communities that we're talking about today do not actually have access to that system. Now, when we talk about the Safe Drinking Water Act, actually, those systems that are covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, actually 92% of them consistently meet all health-based standards under the Safe Drinking Water Act. There are definitely circumstances where there are systems that are not meeting those standards. But those, um, those systems, unfortunately, have a, do have a tendency to um, be to fall into the areas that we will actually see 
as far as disparities and inequities that exist, um, as far as those communities are largely to, more largely to be, you know, those in low income communities and also uh, communities of color. But overall, 92% of those systems um, do consistently meet the standard. And when I'm talking about the Safe Drinking Water Act, I also mentioned the limitations in these private drinking water wells are not included. So the Safe Drinking Water Act covers public water systems. And though in order to be a public water system, um, the system has to have at least 15 connections, at least 15 service connections and service our service at least 25 people. So by private drinking water wells, right, these are drinking water sources that are not going to meet that standard. Um, and then as far as the issue for Safe Drinking Water Act, you know, I mentioned that there are some systems that are not meeting that standard. And I think one of the things that comes to mind very clearly is um, Flint, Michigan. And there is, you know, there is litigation that relates to liability. Um, as re in regards to the Safe Drinking Water Act, you know, one of the cases I included was Briller v. Early, which um, connects to how the Safe Drinking Water Act, right, regulates um, states as public water system owners, but not in their capacity as states, and actually held the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Those officials were not, um, were not, covered by absolute immunity. There is liability that arises from the Safe Drinking Water Act and, and all those in the circumstance of when we look at well water population would not apply. So um, I mentioned those areas. So these well water populations, right? They're not covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and, you know, maybe there's not that significant of an issue that's occurring with this population. Maybe it's a small portion of the population. Well, in all actuality, the well water population in the United States is actually 15% of the population. Um, that's over 43 Americans. And as mentioned, these systems are not covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, private well water owners are themselves responsible for maintaining the safety of their own well water. Um, and actually, most do not follow foundations. Um, the recommendations that are out there are also very confusing. So some of them, depending on whether you're looking to EPA or state regulations, um, some of there are times when they'll conflict as far as how often someone should be testing, what they should be testing for. Um, the EPA recommends testing in relation to, um, you know, local contaminants of which you would be at risk for, but it's very, something kind of very complex for, you know, someone who owns a well system to be able to follow. And it gets, um, you know, even more complex, right, when we have differences that exist as far as in different states. Um, what can be, you know, what's going to be, what a particular population would be at risk for for contamination. And then not only that, some, some tests, right, will say whether or not um, there's a contaminant that is in exceeding, you know, of a, of a Safe Drinking Water Act standard. And then other tests that will just give the numbers. So that can be very hard for um, private individuals to be able to follow. Another thing is with private well owners, by and large, um, there's the perception that if it tastes fine, smells fine, look fine, look fine, then it's fine to drink. And unfortunately, that's not always true. And then the types of contaminants also um, can, can very much so vary as far as those exposures are concerned. Um, now looking at the well water population, there's also a conception that this is a 
largely rural population. And that is correct, right? Um, this population, for the majority of this population is largely rural and that has significance as far as planning um, how to connect these communities, right? Because if you're looking at rural areas, those are areas that are sparsely populated. Um, and, you know, there'll be greater distances, you know, from houses. And, and that's, that is relevant as far as considering cost, right? Because the more distance there is between users, right, that's going to be the less money that could be collected as far as fees in relation to the usage of that water. Also, it increases the expense by how much construction has to be laid out in our connect those communities. However, that's not the only population that is dependent on well water. Actually, 25 to 30% of private drinking well users are in urban areas. And what we find is that many of these communities are peri-urban where they are within commuting distance from a public water system. So, you know, um, talking about some of the issues related to, you know, the rural population, right, it, you might think that it could be kind of an easier fix in um, regard to this population, right, because there's not as much distance between them, um, and then also because they're within commuting distance of a public water system, not as much distance between them and the public water system, but, um, in all actuality, with these communities, there's actually kind of another um, aspect that is difficult to address. And aside from the aspect of just distance. And that goes back to what um, has been observed by sociologists and is being discussed more within public health as municipal underbounding. So um, a lot of times when we talk about, you know, population distributions, right, um, a lot of times it's discussed, you know, that we have um, kind of concentrations of communities in color, of color and um, lower income communities, right, within, you know, the urban center. Um, and some of that is kind of in relation to, you know, our history in relation to um, disturbingly so white flight. However, in the South, and when I say the South, I'm not talking just about, you know, geographically, um, the geographic region, I'm talking about the Southern United States, um, all the way, you know, from coast to coast. So this also covers, um, going out towards California, specifically, this impacts um, communities known as colonias, which are in, you know, Texas and along the U.S.-Mexico um, border. But, you know, in that, in, that, in that area of the United States, in the south, southern portion of the United States, what we observe is kind of the reversal of that pattern, where essentially, the you know communities of color um, are in the periphery, are surrounding cities, and um, a lot of that has to do with patterns of discrimination and um, historical racism. Uh, you know, partially looking at you know the black population in relation to uh, our history of slavery, where essentially communities formed around the, um, the cities to be able to come in and out for work. Um, and then that in addition to housing practices, which forced communities to be outside of this outside of the actual city, but again, close enough to be able to come um, in and out of the city for work. Um, what instead we have are circumstances where um, communities are of color, are outside of the cities, but are not part of those cities. And that bears significance because then there's this pattern of municipal underbounding where cities, municipalities will annex communities, but 
what but a community of color is less likely to actually be annexed within the city boundaries. Um, and then also when it comes down to services that are in, available, right? The city, you know, pursuant to um, the Supreme Court from 1978 Holt, right? Can exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction where the city can decide what services services are available to these communities, right, without and decide not to annex them, not give them voting rights, right, but um, and tax them, but at the same time restrict access to things like public water systems. So, um, you know, that's, that's the pattern that is observed under those circumstances. And race does play a part, um, you know, a communities of color are less likely to be annexed into um, municipal boundaries. And, um, and this, this has, you know, it also impacts in relation to, remember I mentioned the structural determinants of health and the role of power, right? So we're dealing with a circumstance where the, these communities, right, are essentially missing an entire level of government because they're not annexed to the municipal boundaries for a lot of the services that municipalities are you know the city government would provide they have to rely on counties to do that um so that entire unit of government is missing and then from a voting aspect since those communities right are voting in you know county elections there but these policies will more directly impact them but still the other people who are being who were annexed into the city are also voting in these elections so even though the communities that are underbound right are going to be greater impacted by what is occurring kind of with with county policy their vote and they're saying it actually um, is diluted because they're in the same meeting pool, right, as those who are annexed are part of the city um, in that regard. So it, it does have a strain on what services are available to them. And then from, you know, a power ask point also um, puts them in a circumstance where they do have less power in that area. So um, going back, maybe there's not really a problem with contamination. Maybe there, maybe the water is just as safe as for those who are on public water systems. But um, actually, it seems to be the contrary. So um, USGA did a survey and found that one fifth of wells had contamination that exceeded Safe Drinking Water Act standards. Um, those who were in agricultural areas, a quarter of those um, wells were in exceedance of the Drinking Water Act standards, and 34% of those wells were positive for nitrates. Um, in a study of Wake County in North Carolina, 99% of emergency department visits for acute gastrointestinal illnesses was connected to well water contamination. And then um, similarly in Wake County, in a study involving Wake County, North Carolina, Lead levels were found similar to Flint, Michigan in these private drinking water wells. Um, and specifically when it comes to lead, 25 the children who were all drinking well water had a 25 increased likelihood of having elevated blood lead levels. So maybe, so maybe there are some aspects, maybe there's some significant involvement. Um, attention being brought on from public health. Um, I will say the American Public Health Association does have a policy statement in relation to well water. Um, but when we really look at Healthy People 2030, right? And Healthy People is the program by which really standards and goals are set for um, public health programs. Um, so, you know, um, oftentimes, if, uh, you know, if you have a program and you're applying for a grant, it's expected that you can connect to healthy people goals. Um, 
But when it comes down to healthy people, um, here's a screenshot. And you will see that when it comes down to, to drinking water, the target is still focused on those communities that are covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and you will see the target percent is 92.1%. And you will also see, right, there's a you know big um, banner, big mission accomplished banner here that says the targets met are exceeded. So the well water community is not a focus as we see with healthy people. So this is just um, a quick slide invol um, involving what I was describing as far as the structural determinants of health um, and how they impact um, well um, these municipally underbound communities. So this is not um, this is not my particular um, creation as far as the slide is concerned. And um, specifically this um, this just shows you the overall flow. It is based on um, it is based on the structural determinants of health. You can see how that flows out governance. We talked about how entirely our government is missing, um, how local the policies, right? All of that's impacted by these. When we're talking about municipal underbound communities, also um, segregation um, is also an app aspect of it as well. And that all flows into what we were discussing earlier, as far as differences in environmental exposures, um, housing, um, and inadequate municipal services, which all leads to health disparities. So um, based on the current approach um, to kind of address these issues, really um, there's a focus on, you know, federal grants, grants um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there's the Safe Drinking Water Act, um, you know, state revolving fund. And then we also have state regulations with state regulations by and large, those also do not include um, standards. So, Essentially, most states have regulations in relation to well design, well construction, but the more you move towards standards, that's the less states we have actually um, having regulations in those areas. So ultimately, for maintaining the safety of drinking well, um, water wells, that falls to the private drinking well owners themselves. Um, and then one of and then as far as the recommendations that I have, um, one of the things that really um, kind of drove uh, my paper as I was thinking about these aspects, especially looking at power with, was thinking about the cooperative model and looking towards the Rural Electrification Act, which is you know, responsible for much of what we see as far as Access to electricity throughout the United States. So before the before the Rural Electrification Act, you know, 90% of you know farms were not without electricity. In less than 10 years, 80% um, were electrified, had access to electricity. Um, and you know, part of that was through under the Rural Electrification Act. There was the Electric Cooperative Corporation Act, right, which really supported the development of um, cooperatives and um, under the Rural Electrification Act there were low interest you know the no default loans and you know that's significant from a funding structure but also when we look at the cooperative model that really bears significance so we talked about how the entire unit of government for um, you know for our you know, underbound communities is missing, right? Um, and really being in a circumstance, right, under these funding programs, these grant programs where the money still has to go, right, through um, these uh, these other levels of government. Um, so looking at the county involvement and also the municipal involvement, the same units of government that are already excluding these communities. One of the things about the cooperative model is it really has so that 
really the kind of the organization that money can, can instead of being having to go be funneled through those units of governments that are already including these communities um, can put these communities in a position where they have more direct access to it. And you know, under the recent Infrastructure Act, um, you know that that's actually been you know followed for broadband. Um, there are protections for broadband um, under the broad, under the broadband provisions for cooperatives. Explicit recognition of cooperatives, however, the same is not the case um, when it comes down to issues of safe drinking water. So um, that's why you know I think that model would be beneficial as especially when we think of issues of power and also issues of that, that level of government being missing now um also um one another recommendation is to stress the importance of prioritizing underserved um well dependent communities um we you know and this is this is very challenging um recent recently as Many of you are probably aware with Justice um, Justice Forty, right? Race explicitly um, was not being used as you know a factor for um, for the prioritizations of funds. Um, you know, however, when we think about when it comes to safe drinking water, one of the things you know, as I was talking about with the structural determinants of health and really looking at these municipally underbound communities is that we see um, a pattern in relation to discrimination and exclusion that can also be used as a good proxy as far as prioritizing these communities. So um, that's an important aspect. And then also, I wanted to also underscore no competition between underserved communities. So currently, you know, how much of the provisions as far as funding is concerned, including changes that was made with the Infrastructure Act, there is that this recognition of underserved and disadvantaged communities, but um, without really kind of necessarily kind of setting aside the prioritization of those communities that are, you know, well dependent. And this can raise potential issues. I brought up very briefly the issues of, um, of liability and standards. So there's already um, an existing kind of incentive, right, to, you know, prioritize those, you know, those communities who are under the public water systems and who do actually need consideration um, and need more provisions of service to meet those standards, right, with well-dependent communities. And part of the issue is we, you know, those communities also do need attention. And I do stress that action needs to be taken in that area. But we do not want to be in a position where these well dependent communities are continuing to be forgotten. So they also need their own provisions as far as dedication to allowing them to have access to safe drinking water. Thank you. And with that, I'm open. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Oh, there comes Tracy. Uh, I was going to start by um, noting uh, Professor Q's very interesting question about um, the rights of individuals, because certain states have granted them a right to a clean environment, and whether this might be a way, at least in those states, to get um, force action, I guess, if you will, to provide uh, the safety and water and, and water or different water sources necessary for those that are on well water. I, um, yes, and I and also I do want to underscore that I do think in the United States also the recognition of a right to water is very important. Um, you know that that has come up as an issue. Uh, um, unfortunately, repeatedly in the United States, right, uh, it has not supported it. But um, I do want to underscore that I do think that's an important aspect of addressing access to water in the United States. And um, I do also, um, in the sewage context, in the wastewater um, context, want to underscore the work that Catherine Flowers has done in that area. Um, but looking, but but going to your question specifically 
a connection, right? Yes, recognition of the right to a safe, safe and healthy environment is, is, um, is something I think could be beneficial as far as addressing these particular issues. Um, it does, it does, in a sense, get a little bit challenging still from that funding structure, right? Because at the same time, we do um, need money to address these issues. And there's been increases in funding, right? But at the same token, um, if how that money is structured is in a way that these communities are not gaining the direct access to it, that could potentially um, pose a barrier. Now, for those states that does have that recognition, there is the area of kind of litigation to move forward with, um, with that particular issue, and that could be um, beneficial. Of course, we also know litigation could be, um, is not a fast process. Um, it um, takes times and a lot of changes could occur within that period. But yes, um, I do think that the recognition of of a right it, um, would definitely be very helpful in this context. Excellent. Uh, I might jump in as well and ask a question, uh, but also before I do, for everyone who's online, if you have any questions you'd like to post in the chat box, we're glad to curate them and collect. Uh, I, it's what, I have a combined, what, what the dreaded comments, but then with a question to follow up. Uh, the comment is that the there has been interest of the role of lawyers in providing assistance to underserved communities in urban colonias to obtain access to public water supplies. Uh, for example, in the area, in the Houston Galveston County area that encompasses Houston, uh, there's been a tally of close to nearly 30 different uh, communities that the city are, they can point it out, are very urban. The city went around them and never incorporated them, and they are not connected as a result of either water or sewer system. Uh, we had tried to organize a pro bono initiative to have lawyers help those corp companies, in fact, communities, create special purpose water corporations or to connect them to the city services. But one thing you might want to consider in your article is whether or not there's a role for a private pro bono assistance to lawyers. In that's perhaps a helpful role prior to a lawyer or not. Uh, but the question I had was one of the biggest challenges we have as we try to set up these corporations is community reluctance. I'm sorry, can you hear me? I'm sorry, towards the end, I'm starting to get a little bit of interference. My fault. I'm sorry, there's an 18 wheeler just to find me. Um, I was saying one of the issues we had in setting up these corporations was community reluctance. That as they are currently getting their water, it's free. They just draw it directly from a well in the area they control. So when you connect them to the city, you have to create an infrastructure and an oversight body that oftentimes has costs associated with it. And uh, it's surprising the effort it takes to get people comfortable with that if they ever do. So I was curious, is the rural electrification initiative that you've used as an example, uh, you know, one of the differences is that they didn't have electricity and then they got it as an initial good. Here they're getting water, it's just terrible service or poor quality. Do you see a way that you can help in the way you describe the framework to help those communities sort of make that transition? Yeah, um, I do, you know, I do think part of it has to be um, in relation to education. So education is going to be an important aspect. So the per, you know the perception of these communities often is right that as long as it looks fine, tastes fine, smells fine, right, it's safe. And I think that's one area to start off to really educate communities on what risks really exist with their water. Um, and some of that will require you know testing. And some of these issues did. Um, it it is it does it does pose the additional challenge, right? Because it, at least I do have water, right? Um, as opposed to being in a circumstance, right, where there's where you don't have any access to that resource. But there was um, a lot of education that needed to be done with the Rural Electrification Act, um, specifically in relation to the cost. 
So um, under the Rural Electrification Act, many of the farmers were hesitant about these low interest, no default loans. There was a lot of trust that existed there and a lot of concern as far as cost is concerned. One of the important things as far as the education aspect of it is we also have to be aware that, you know, kind of in public health, whenever it comes to knowledge, you know, knowledge is not going to be enough to result in behavior change. So um, we will really have to take this time to educate communities and be aware of what specific values are important to those communities. So um, one of the areas, right, that you know, pointed to was lead. A lot of communities may not be, be aware of their exposure to lead. So, you know, specifically with lead, um, lead is unique. Um, as you know, a contaminant because it's not something that is actually going to be coming from, you know, the environment itself. It's going to be leaching out through the well and co um, components and the piping. And um, I don't want to go too much into you know the lead and copper rule or any of that. But um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act, there are provisions to you know manage corrosion control with water that are not are not being done um, as far as um, well systems are concerned. So um, being able to point that out and connect to the risk that specifically children face, I think is very important and may be a value um, to underscore. But yes, that education piece is going to be very significant. Um, also in understanding the nature of cooperatives, yes, um, it does have to very much so begin at the community level. Um, one thing we have to understand as lawyers is that communities will not automatically trust us. And then not only that, community concern, you know, may be different from our own. So, um, you know, we may be in a circumstance where we're seeing, you know, a significant source of, you know, contamination, right? For a particular, you know, I'll just bring up, for example, maybe, you know, arsenic, right? But at the same time, you know, that community may be more concerned about the impacts that their children, you know, may be facing from lead. So having the flexibility there, I think is very important. Um, another aspect, you know, when it comes to working with communities, you know, I I kind of have my, 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 three, my three Cs. So um, one of them is community as expert, the other one is a collaborative process. And then the third is community driven. So, um, you know, part of working with the community is realizing that they have their own expertise. You know, I think I've been talking a lot about, you know, testing and in, in technical aspects, um, you know, things that are quantifiable. But um, one thing to also keep in mind is that communities, right? We, I think I, we have a tendency to overlook the value of qualitative data. So really realize that the communities have their own expertise and their own knowledge and not necessarily just having it so that the knowledge is coming from us, but realizing that those communities are in fact experts and utilizing that. So you might be in a circumstance, right, where I was just talking about lead and lead contamination, right, but completely overlooking you know, that the impact of a CAFO, concentrated animal feeding operation on that community. And that community may, may be more concerned about that in the immediacy. And you can't just ignore that. You, um, that other C is the collaborative process. It has to be a partnership, right? So it's not necessarily being the community to do something, but working with the community to come up with a solution. And yes, for that community, they may have a more immediate priority that they want to address in that regard. So um, and then community driven, it's important that the community drives it and be able to shape the conversation and be in a position where they um, have a leadership role um, as far as that is concerned. So um, that's all very important. Uh, and then when we talk about 
really community involvement, right? I, you don't also want to just focus on the big scary stuff, but you know, yes, there's going to be a cost, but also focus on areas of self-efficacy where we go over the fact that there is now increased funding um, to support um, water infrastructure. So really being able to also educate the community about what is currently available and how they could gain access to it is a very important aspect of, of really um, getting communities on board on getting access to safe drinking water. So thank you. That's a very rich answer. Uh, I've been monitoring the chat box. I don't see any other questions if, unless someone has any. I'll have one other question. Uh, I did want to note, however, that Alban has posted the CLE code credit for those of you who want to play CLE uh, with registration. So uh, the other question I had is, of course, the one question that transects almost every legal question we all work on is climate change. I was wondering if you had a sense of how climate change is going to affect water availability in peri-urban communities and how that might affect your proposal. Yeah, so um, climate change um, is going to have an impact. So um, depending on you know where you're involved locally, right? So that may be um, issues of where we're looking at um, actually a reduced right access to water. So where um, wells are not being recharged, right? Um, and then also areas of increased contamination um, also being an issue. So um, I mentioned, you know, the colonias, right? And for a lot of wells in the colonias, those have a tendency to be um, shallow wells, right? Um, and with shallow wells, you have, and if you have also a circumstance where there's increased flooding, that is especially susceptible to contamination. But yes, climate change will very much so impact communities' access to water, um, and specifically for well water. In some communities, they will see, you know, less water available, um, like due to less groundwater um, recharge. And then other communities will see an increase in, um, in contamination due to flooding events. Thank you. Uh, so I'll pause one more time unless anyone has any other questions. So I'm looking to our, our participants. Uh, no, it looks like then I've, we've come to the part of the presentation. Wait, I see someone, the sun raising their hand. Victor, go for it. That wasn't a hand raise, that was a thank you. I really, I really enjoyed this. It's a big problem um, that affects so many people. And I, 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 I'm interested that it's finally moving into sort of the sociocultural discussion as, and public health discussion, as well as always looking at from the legal lens and how those are connected, so thank you. And let me add as well my thank you. Uh, it is a wonderful topic, and I know it, it is one of those environmental issues that actually really directly affects the growth and the quality of the life people have, particularly for the surf community. So, uh, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to then, uh, first of all, thank you one more time on behalf of all of us, and then ask Avanti Kut to give us a preview of our next speaker and to remind everyone about how they can get CLE credit. And uh, thank, uh, thank everybody for participating for today as well. Yes, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be able to, to talk with you today.